Hello, and welcome to my channel. My name is Jonathan Cohn, and today I have my book review of the book, Tales of Light and Life, a High Republic anthology collection that is from the Disney Lucasfilm Press. This is uh, a collection of short stories. They're, they're not exactly novellas. They're a bit too short to be novellas. So I would, I would classify them as a short story collection. I believe there's 10 short stories in this collection. Nine of them uh, are just general short stories for the collection, but one of them is unique to this version of the collection, which I'll talk about in a moment. But uh, for those of you who are trying to understand where books take place and when you should read them and stuff, this book requires you to have the knowledge, I think, of Phase 1 and Phase 2 of the Higher Public. They deal with uh, the events of, May of Phase 1, then they go back and it also deals with events in Phase 2, and then it actually has some, uh, some of, about half of the stories are actually set after Phase 1 and are leading into Phase 3. So it's actually um, uh, really integral that you know the backstory and you know everything for the higher public before you read this because you will for sure get spoiled on some things. Um, not everything, but you will get spoiled on a lot if you if you read this first. So this should be something you read after you finish the phase one and two books. Um, getting into my general thoughts on the book, I actually purchased it on release day. I've had it this for about two months now, but I just didn't get around to actually reading it until recently because I, I just didn't feel compelled to read it. Even though this, I, I do a, review a lot of Star Wars books, I try to read every new release on release day and stuff, this book, it just wasn't hooking me in the marketing, and I was just afraid I wasn't going to like it, so I kind of just, I just waited till uh, later to read it, and I, it actually came out about how I thought the book would come out, sadly. I didn't love the book. I didn't hate it. It's not, it's not, it's not bad. It's just, I just didn't like the book. So there, out of the 10 short stories, there are three short stories I would classify as being good short stories, or even perhaps one or two of them, great short stories. Then you have four of the short stories that I just didn't care for. Yeah, they're fine. And then three short stories that unfortunately I thought were bad, or were, were not good at all. I thought those three short stories that were bad were, were, were additions to the collection that I did not wish were there. Um, and that's unfortunate. And I have enjoyed phases one and two um, uh, a lot. I, I enjoyed how phase two was more closely connected than phase one. The books were all tended to be, especially with the adults and young adult, tended to be really interconnected well and flowed really well together. Phase one books didn't flow together well, but each individual book I felt was a better offering uh, between the adult and middle grade, at least. Uh, young adult, not so much. But the adult and middle grade, I thought those books were themselves better than the phase two books. That being said, I went into this interested in seeing how the authors would all work out. Certainly, I enjoy some authors more than others, but I was curious to see uh, how everything would stack up in this book. So let me briefly give a rundown on what I thought of each individual story. So the first story is The Queen's Bloom by Zoraida Cordova. It follows Axel Greylark in college as he goes through some shenanigans at a party um, that his parents also happen to be at. This was one of the ones I unfortunately just didn't care for. You also have um, uh, a Closed Fist Has No Claws by Tessa Grattan. This was a story that follows uh, uh, Mari Rowe uh, as she uh, recalls some memories and brings people into her new group. It's basically a book, a story that kind of shows you how the path of the open hand is turning into the... Um, uh, into the Nile, and I thought that was a, a very boring story, sadly. I, I didn't care for that one. But then we had the third story, which is, in my opinion, one of the best stories in the collection, and that is Shield of the Jedi by George Mann. This is a story following Padawan Rupert Natani, that, who is sent on a mission, or rather her trial, her Jedi trial, to find her master's shield. Along the way, she is forced to help out a local people dealing with a mythical creature threatening them. This was a great story. I loved this story. This story was, when I got to the story in the book, I was like, there you go, that's what this type of story, this book needed. I thought that that story was delightful in, in all the best ways. So I really enjoyed that story. Next, 
I have the fourth story, which is called, titled, The Lonely Traveler is Home by Daniel Jose Older. In this story, uh, you follow Padawan's uh, Ram Jamaram as he tries to cheer up his homesick friend Zine by throwing her a party on Starlight Beacon, obviously before, you know, the events of The Fallen Star. And... Um, uh, for, for some reason, he just can't figure out how to, to, to cheer her up. And, uh, then the book has an interesting twist. And this by far was the most juvenile of the stories. It was the story that felt most geared towards kids. Most of the other stories felt either YA or even in some ways adult, but that story by far felt like it was designed for little kids. Um, and it, it, it had, it was, it was meant to pack an emotional punch and it kind of did, but it was, it was not the kind of story that this collection really needed, in my opinion. Then you have after the fall. This is when things heat up in the book, um, in terms of storytelling. This follows Addie Hollow after the events of the fallen star and deals with her figuring out what to do next. It deals with the aftermath of the events. It deals with characters grieving, characters figuring out their business, figure, characters figuring out how they're going to react in the world. Um, this one was good in the sense that it gave us some uh, some context to the universe and it gave us some bigger things that are happening. But unfortunately, it didn't... Um, uh, it, it, it wasn't amazing as a f- in terms of fun and being entertaining to follow. Uh, but it did answer some questions that I think were, were good. We also the short follow, uh, have the short story, The Force Provides by Justina Ireland. Uh, this was a story that follows Vernestra Rowe after the events of The Fallen Star. It, is, uh, it follows her path as a way seeker. Um, uh, she gets entangled in a kind of a local trade dispute. And uh, it, was, it was an okay story. It was okay. Then we follow All Jedi Walk Their Own Path by Charles Soule. This follows two stories from Belzedafar, who is one of my favorite characters in the, um, uh, in the High Republic. Uh, he, one of them is a flashback with him and Loden helping this local people on a planet, and the other one is in the present time after the events of the Fallen Star, where he is searching through the wreckage to try to find his friend Buryaga, who he is not sure if he is alive or dead. And if you have watched the Ahsoka show, you probably will feel a little bit of extra resonance because this reminds me of the fifth episode from that show. Um, but this this was, I think, a, a good story. Um, you also have Light in the Darkness by Kevin Scott. This focuses on the new, some new characters. So all the previous stories have focused on characters we've read about before in some form or fashion. But this, this story I'm talking about now, Light in the Darkness by Kevin Scott, it follows new characters Hoy and Kian as they struggle in the Outer Rim due to the Niles Barrier stopping the higher public forces, including the Jedi, from rescuing them. This this story, I was just like, I really don't care about these characters. I don't know whether these characters are going to be major parts of Phase Three. I kind of hope not, because they just weren't entertaining to read about. Um, and and it, there are some familiar faces that pop in in this story, but it just it, this one this was one I didn't care for. Then we also have um, the story a call the Call of Coruscant by Lydia Kang. And this was following Pad- Padawan Amadeo Azazo, I hope I said that, pronounced pronounce that correct, and his master, who are called back to Coruscant during a mission after the events of the Fallen Star to plan the Jedi's future against the Nile. And while on Coruscant, Amadeo goes exploring Coruscant to make some new, unlikely friends. This was also a very good story. This, the story, The Call of Coruscant, is the story that answers the most questions that we had after the Fallen Star while also telling just a fun story within this short story collection. Um, uh, it, did, it did its, its job uh, very, very well. Uh, and then you have the 10th story in here. Um, uh, I, I would call it a bonus story, and that is by Alyssa Wong. And this is, a, uh, uh, this is exclusive to the Barnes & Noble edition of the book. And this features the characters Crash and Svino on Corellia, finding a, a kind of a, a Nile Jedi and trying to uncover their identity and purpose on Corellia. This story didn't love, didn't, didn't really care for it either, um, although I recognize some of the characters from that. So when you're thinking about the book as a whole, you got to think, how did I feel overall about it? How do I feel about the individual stories? How do I feel about the way they handled this? So going into a little bit of that, how I feel about it overall I think that if you are an absolute completionist, 
by the book. If you're someone that you have certain characters that you just think you are so connected to Vernestra Rowe, or you really f- uh, feel connected to, to Bell Zetafire, maybe owning this book is valuable to you because you want to have every story therein or something. Or if you really like short story collections, perhaps this will work for you. For me, Short story collections are already incredibly difficult for me to enjoy because usually there's some good ones, some bad ones, some in between, but rarely do I find a short story collection where every story is just excellent, 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 excellent. That's very rare. Um, and so it's, it's, it's more difficult to pull off a short story collection in my opinion. And this one, it doesn't, it doesn't do a stellar job. It just, it's kind of okay. Part of the problem I think with this is they tried to make it too broad. You have short stories from phase one, you have short stories from phase two, short stories that lead into phase three. There, it does, it, it feels like they were, they had all these short story ideas and they were like, rather than put them in separate collections focused on the era or narrowing down our focus for this story, they just decided to, to throw in whatever they could about the High Republic and let the different writers choose their favorite characters to follow. Like, of course, um, uh, Affy Hollow is going to be written by Claudia. Of course, Vernestra is going to be written by Justina Ireland. Of course, Belle Zetafar is going to be written by Charles Soule. Like, they're just natural. It makes sense that they would write these in this way. Um, but I think they could have narrowed the focus. Had I been uh, c- consulting on this, I would have suggested that this book be focused entirely on the events after the Fallen Star. Make each short story connected to after the events of the Fallen Star so that you can uh, f- uh, fixate on that, you can tell the aftermath of the Fallen Star, and you can lead us into Phase 3. Instead, you have three from Phase 2, two, um, uh, one story, or maybe it's two stories from uh, the end of phase one, and then you have the rest are from after phase uh, one going into phase three, and it's just, it's just unnecessarily broad in my opinion. Uh, there is also the discussion about the Barnes & Noble edition. The Barnes & Noble edition of this book uh, in my opinion, does not have as good artwork as the uh, as the regular edition of the book, which I will uh, put on the screen here. Um, and so that's one problem with it. But the Barnes and Noble edition has uh, an extra story to it, has one additional story, and to me, that is a problem uh, for for a couple of reasons. For one. You are, it is already difficult to convince people to buy short story collections anyway. And it is also, when you do things like this where you add a bonus story into a different edition, it makes people who feel who bought the original, not knowing about it, feel a little bit bad. It makes them feel like, hey, I just spent all my money on this and it's not even the complete story. It's not even all of the short stories that are in this collection. You're telling me there's another a uh, version I need to buy. And from a business perspective, you think, well, that means we get to sell two. But I think that you anger your audience a little bit. And I think that that was not the wise decision. Plus, uh, this book just has a blank background with just the logo of the, the High Republic on it and the logo of the Jedi Order and stuff. And it's just it's just not enough of a cover to pop to audiences. The I don't even think that the uh, original cover is amazing, but it's better. And if they had kept that original cover, I think it would have worked well. I saw someone on Twitter, and I don't remember who it was, but I saw someone on Twitter basically say that they would um, uh, buy both editions and they'd take the cover slip or they, they, they take the jacket from the regular edition and put it over the Barnes & Noble edition so that they could get the bonus story and the nice cover art on a single edition. And I'm just like, why didn't you do that from the first place? Um, so that's a little frustrating to me. That's, that's a part of the business of this industry that I, I do not like when publishers do that. So I think it was pff, okay as a short story collection. There's nothing about this that makes me think oh man, did we need this? Or oh man, is this like an integral plot part of the story? I think that if you were to not read this short story collection, I think that you would probably fill in enough of the gaps with phase three. Knowing how good the authors are at filling you in, I don't think that you need to have read this book. So that makes it a little bit even less uh, important in that sense. And so, as I said, if you're a completionist, read the book because you're a completionist, or if you really love this character, maybe give the book a shot. Otherwise, 
it just it's just frustrating, um, especially since it's part of the YA line, and the YA line just has not been hitting uh, on, on full cylinders for a while. Um, they had some good books in 2019, 2017, 2016, but ever since about 2020, the, the YA line has just been, been floundering, and it's really disappointing. So that's my general view of the Tales of Light and Life from a various um, authors from the High Republic. Uh, I believe that the editor on this was Michael Seglane, um, but it may. Uh, but I, I think he was the editor. So if you've read this, let me know your thoughts on them. Did, were there short stories you loved more than I did? There's short stories you hated more than I did? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section down below. But until next time, I'm Jonathan, and thank you for watching.